Hey everybody, Darren Little John here. Welcome to episode 6 of the 12 Step Buddhist Podcast. Today I've done the first Skype interview of the podcast series and it came off pretty well. It's 42 minutes in length. You'll have to pardon a couple of the glitches, but then again, this is a podcast and not a super polished, mega professional, advertising filled radio production. So without further ado, I'll turn you on to that, and I hope that you enjoy it. Thanks for your questions, and uh, FYI, the book is at the presses right now and uh, scheduled for release March 10th. Pre-order at Amazon.com, and let me know how you like this podcast. Okay, here we go. We're here today with uh, Dr. Sarah Ullman, a PhD of uh, clinical psychology and neuropsychology, board-certified expert in traumatic stress specializing in the social neuroscience of sexual addiction and arousal dysregulation. Dr. Ullman, thank you for being with us today. Um, I just wanted to say that um, it was a special pleasure for me to be here, um, uh, not just for you, of course, but for your audience. Um, uh, you know, obviously the combination of 12-step recovery and um, Buddhist philosophy uh, is a winning combination for me, so it's great to be here. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, um, I guess I should just explain to the audience a little bit about how I came, how, how we uh, came to know each other. I think I, I posted an article on Twitter uh, by another neurologist uh, who had said something um, about sex addiction. And I think he was kind of refuting the, um, the empirical data on the, on the neurology of... Um, of those type of addictions, and, we, and, and that is one of the questions I want to get into with you. But um, then Dr. Ullman kind of posted back to me and said, "Hey, thanks for posting that, and here's my website, which is thesexaddictedbrain.com." Right. So that appears to be your specialty area. Could you describe for us briefly your professional background and and what you did your PhD in? If you're doing any ongoing academic research or private practice? Yes, yes, and yes. Um, my background um, academically is a cross between clinical psychology, f philosophy, and neuroscience, um, specifically social neuroscience. Uh, my actual background is I have a PhD in clinical psychology and neuropsychology. Um, I have two master's degrees in counseling psychology and clinical psychology with a specialty in uh, psychotraumatology. Um, I have double bachelor's degrees in uh, philosophy and psychology. So uh, to sum it all up academically, um, I am sort of the, uh, the new cross, if you will, because there's lots of us apparently that are up and coming, the new cross between psychology, uh, neuroscience, and philosophy. Um, and when you package it all together, that forms what we now call social neuroscience. You know, this is very interesting because in the tradition um, that I practice, one of the teachings is to kind of separate out different aspects of reality in a way that would seemingly make it appear that these are unique, separate, and not connected intrinsically to each other. But really, it's sort of like, a, I think, a way to sort of focus the lens a little bit to kind of see this different side of the diamond, if you will, and then you pull back and see the rainbow light emanating from the entire culmination of those aspects. You know, it's fascinating that you said that. Of course, this is a whole podcast in and of itself, so feel free to redirect me as needed. Um, but uh, I just finished reading a wonderful book called Descartes' Bones, which brings me back to this whole... Um, uh, separation between philosophy and church and uh, hence religion and um, different specialties. Um, yet back then, you sort of to be anybody, if you will, you were a combination philosopher, psychologist, not that there was one back then, uh, spiritualist, uh, church person. And so this harkens back to, um, you know, it. it should we have everything as a separate thing? Should we separate uh, religion from philosophy, from neuroscience? And my training is that I had to, um, back in the day, have separate 
training in all of these distinct fields to the point where, you know, at some point you say, okay, this is really all one thing, and we're just looking at different aspects of one thing. So if you will, where I'm coming from is to say, you know what, here I am, a one human being that has all these different backgrounds and beliefs, yet to me, I see no distinction. They are simply aspects of the same realm. So there you have it. No, that makes a lot of sense to me, and actually... You know, there's a lot of things that um, I looked at in my book, The 12 Step Buddhist, where I felt that I had to really um, explain myself to my psychology professors, for example, in, in my undergraduate work, in terms of my 12 step spiritual background and experience, which I felt was extremely valid. It was my entire identity as a student endeavoring to understand the mind through the science of psychology. And it was really difficult to get anybody interested in, or to even uh, have a conversation because they were so kind of tunnel vision on the pure science aspect of their of their field. You know, it's interesting you say that um, as a related aside, if you will. It took me, and, and here we go, I'll say this in public, 16 years to complete my last PhD because when they said sex addiction, the neuroscience of sex addiction, First of all, there's no such thing as sex addiction and neuroscience. What are you talking about? Uh, you know, unless you want to talk about some ganglion cell, um, we can't even hear you. So, I, I to say I share your pain in terms of the uh, supposed experts in the field not being able to understand a connection between these things that to me are obvious, uh, which is spirituality, which is neuroscience. I, I see them as the same. So it, the best thing I can say is I, I feel and share your pain on that level. And it's a shame that we have to go through that. But, well, yeah, I mean, Reggie Ray, um, the famous uh, student of uh, Chogam Trunkpa Rinpoche, who's now uh, a teacher in his own right, was just here in Portland a, a couple of weeks ago. And one of the things, one of the points that he made was that he felt that, uh, you know, and I think he's an anthropologist and, and in the in the academic circles that he associates with, he felt that there is a, an emerging um, connection or dialogue, and this may be, it's probably, I would think, due to the Dalai Lama's past 15 years of work with the different fields of consciousness uh, study and, and neurology and that sort of thing, but certainly he's played a big role in that. But the idea being that um, rather than saying, well, who's right, East or West, you know, we should be saying, hey, um, we've got stuff to learn from each other. Correct. You know, Buddhism has studied the mind for over 2,500 years. And we have some pretty great physics and, uh, you know, analytical scientific methods uh, in the West and a great body of knowledge. So why don't we have a discussion and help this be, Reggie's point was, the next step in the conscious evolution of humanity. Yeah, the Dalai Lama, who suffice it to say, is my hero, and I don't come by that term lightly. Um, one of the, I think, greatest legacies that he'll leave to a myriad people, um, other than his teachings and, and beliefs in general, uh, is that he has single-handedly sought to link and did a very good job, hence his, one of his latest books, if you will, um, in a sense, the neuroscience of spirituality, the neuroscience of Buddhism, and how, in a sense, he didn't say, I won't quote him as saying this, but in a sense he said, um, Buddhism has recognized the scientific method way before you guys did, and, you know, <laughs> you know, thanks everybody, the Western world, for finally catching up to us. Um, that's my interpretation, if you will. Um, and again, I think his legacy is that he is uniting um, uh, East and West. And people are starting to listen because he is somebody that um, East and West can listen to. So I, you know, hence he's, he's been my hero for uh, several reasons, that being one of them. Yeah, that, that kind of thing makes a lot of sense and it's really close to home for me and the work that I'm trying to do. Um, I guess we just have as a, as a sort of a human tendency the need to compartmentalize 
in order yeah. to understand. And yeah, let me say something. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. But let me oh, just say something yeah. about that. I think that compartmentalizing is our biggest friend and, a big, and our biggest enemy. On one hand, clinically, when I work with sex addicts, you know, they compartmentalize very well. My job is to sort of integrate them. Mm -hmm. However, I, I think that the enemy is not compartmentalizing. I think we need to do that. I think from a neurological point of view, that's how we learn. That's how we get things, if you will. The problem, as I see it, in my opinion, is not that we compartmentalize. We need to do that. The problem is that we stop there, that we compartmentalize it and leave everything uh, in separate vessels, that we don't then, which I, I would like to think is, is natural, to then say, okay, what do we have here, and then bring it all together. And unfortunately, it's, it takes a little more effort to do that for a lot of folks, and so we stay compartmentalized. That, to me, is where the danger is. Yeah, and the, the point of Buddhist meditation is, uh, at least uh, some of the experiences that I've had in my own practice, uh, is just that kind of where we began the discussion uh, you know, we can look at an object and we can say that object is empty of inherent concrete existence uh, from its own side. It doesn't exist as the, you know, conceptual framework that we superimpose or impute on it. And yet there it is. You know, here's my coffee cup. It's here. It's got coffee in it. I'm going to drink some. Does that mean it's not there? Well, it does mean at the same time as it's being uh, in, in emptiness, it actually is appearing as this distinct object in the present moment. So simultaneously, both relative and absolute truth are coexistent. But we can focus our lens in a little bit, meditate, and get contemplative about our experience. And then, uh, in so doing, open up our frame of reference, expand our um, experience in a way that's less rigid, less fear based less controlling. Absolutely. Um, I, I don't know that I could have said that better. Um, and in fact, uh, Darren, the, the wonderful thing is that neuroscience is starting to catch on and recognize this. Again, from a, from a neuroscience point of view, we know, because research has demonstrated this, of course there are other ways of knowing, but let's stick with this for a moment. We know, from a scientific point of view, that People who are more spiritual, again, we're going to leave religion out of this for a minute, but people who are more spiritual branch more dendrites. Um, they are better able to abstract and conceptualize, and um, in a sense, we know on autopsy that their brains are literally richer and fuller with more dendritic branching. What does that tell you? I don't even have to make a case for that. There you have it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I've been watching a lot of the uh, work of uh, Dr. Volko and Nida and so forth. I, I used a ton of her work uh, for, my, yeah. for my book. I took the leap of putting a, a chapter on uh, the hard research to help people understand that addiction is a brain disease and not a moral issue, although the addict certainly acts in immoral ways. But that's not the whole right. story. <laughs> you know, so yeah. I'm learning a little bit about how scientists are looking at the brain activities through MRIs and so forth and seeing how um, different areas of the brain actually grow or are, grow through spiritual practice or are diminished through a, a participation in addiction. Absolutely. Um, this brings us to one of the questions um, you had posed for me. Um, in my research, um, and I'll read you the title, because in all the years that I've done this research, I, it, it's so convoluted. Um, it, it, my actual research, my initial dissertation, which I've extended, is actually called a uh, neuropsychological examination of neural plastic alteration in the dorsolateral and orbital prefrontal functions secondary to early childhood sexual traumatic uh, exposure in adult male sex addicts. What does that mean? It means what that people have, been, people have been traumatized as children and have a difficulty making proper decisions as adults because that's what the prefrontal cortex is all about, right? That's correct. It means that literally through no fault of their own, they're a very specific part of the prefrontal cortex was damaged. There's, there's brain damage, if you will. Um, 
it, by the way, that's not irreparable. I'll get to that in a second. But there's brain damage there, and it damages the part of the brain that has to do with what? Impulsivity, decision making, um, compartmentalization, impulse control, um, to be, if you will, grounded. All of the things that we think of when we think of in terms of personality, there's that sort of Jekyll and Hyde um, feeling that all addicts share. You know, there's sort of the, um, the secret them, and then there's the public them. Um, all of these things are subserved under a very specific part of the prefrontal cortex. We know that without touch at all, by the way, early childhood sexual abuse, and yes, I am saying even sexual abuse without touch, if it's done during a certain part of your development, uh, typically before age 15, because that's when the prefrontal cortex uh, starts to really develop. So when these things happen before age 15 and the earlier, the more severe, what happens is it literally changes the neurochemistry, the chemistry in your brain for certain areas of your limbic system, like your amygdala and your prefrontal cortex, and it literally changes the shape of your brain. That's not your skull, that's your brain. And so what happens is you grow up with these uh, damaged or, if you will, altered and immature areas of your brain so that by the time you're an adult, let's say 25 and on, um, then what happens is your behavior, your judgment, everything is altered. And it, so, you know, you become sort of dopamine addicted, which is what a sex addict is, It's because it's not really about sex, right? Um, it's about the part of your brain that can't turn off that flow of dopamine and needs ever increasing amounts of it. So, does this have anything to do with your morals? No, that's a separate issue, okay? Um, but does it have to do with your behavior? It does, okay? Because, you know, you're you're craving dopamine. What's the best way to get it? Well, that would be sex. Yeah, so, and, and there's that, and that's the conflict of self-loathing between the addict. You know, my, my first sponsor in the 12-step community said to me that, you know, a drunk, uh, an alcoholic rather, is a drunk with a conscience. Yeah. Well, you know what? It, it substitute the word sex and sex addiction, and it's the same thing. Well, that was one uh, of my main questions that I wanted to get from you today. Yeah. It is um, if you could explain the differences um, between what happens in the brain. And I, I can already guess where you're going to go with it, but I want to know. I want everybody to know that, that there's hard research behind this. You know, some people would say, well, you know, um, sex addiction or pr another process addiction like gambling, for example, right. or shopping or compulsive anything, um, texting, uh, uh, social networking, et cetera, is um, not a real addiction because it doesn't do the same thing that, say, heroin does on the brain when it when it kind of uh, grabs the molecule in between, you know, two synapses and says, no, uh, you need me now and uh, you can't survive without me. So explain if you would for us in, in, uh, in whatever kind of terms you like. Oh, boy. Um, stop me after an hour, will you? Okay, okay. Um, first of all, there's a reason that um, we differentiate addictions um, verbally by using the term process addiction versus drug addiction. Let me state categorically as clearly as possible that just because we use the term process in front of some addictions does not make it any less an addiction. Now, from my standpoint, I use the lens of a neuroscience um, uh, vernacular, which means that I see addiction from an absolute medical terminology. In order to be addicted to something, Okay, we're not talking French fries or Starbucks here, although I can sort of get that, but we're not talking Starbucks addiction or golf addiction. We're talking about things that we call process addictions like self-harm, people that cut, yes. gamblers, um, eating disorders, um, sex addiction, you know, the things that it, a lot of people have heard in the literature that we banty about and call addiction. Let me talk about why these things are a real addiction. Please. And the reason we call them a process addiction. Let me use it by way of saying, 
People don't question when you talk about alcoholism as an addiction or heroin as an addiction, right, drug addiction, because it's easy to see and grasp. If you're an alcoholic and you have an alcohol addiction, we can see that picking up a glass or a bottle and guzzling a substance can change how you feel and therefore alters your brain. In fact, that's why people take the substances they take, because they feel good, because they alter their brain. So we understand that. Here is where a process addiction does the exact same thing, but indirectly. Let me, let me say more about that. To a, per, to a non-sex addict having sex, okay, anybody that has sex knows that the act of having sex allows you to be in an altered state. It feels good, which is why people do it, which is why people like it. That's just like gambling. The reason people gamble initially is because it feels good, and then they continue doing it because it feels even better. Yes? Okay. So things that create an addiction are done because they initially feel great. All right, now let's look at the difference between a process addiction and a non-process addiction. Process addictions alter the brain exactly as much and sometimes more than the addictions where that are direct, meaning taking a drink or shooting up some heroin. Okay, Here's why. To a sex addict, for example, these people have a serotonin depletion. They are in constant need of a fix. Their fix isn't alcohol, it's dopamine. They literally crave dopamine. Okay, We all do but their craving doesn't stop. Let me give you an example. To a sex addict having sex, it, part of the addiction, part of the problem with sex addiction is a problem of intimacy, okay? Meaning that they have trouble connecting. Process addictions in general are known as attachment disorders in a non-neuroscience sense. When somebody who is a sex addict is having sex, they are having a dopamine rush. It's like injecting heroin into their veins, okay? It doesn't just feel good, okay? To them, it's a necessity. And it's not even about feeling good because a sex addict or a gambler or a cutter actually gets high before they actually engage in the process that is their addiction. For just, example... Just planning and, and getting involved in the acquisition stage. Absolutely. Absolutely. And here's why it's a real, true, blue, neurological addiction. Because what happens in their brain as they sort of go through their ritual to the sex addict, it would be perhaps logging onto the internet, knowing in anticipation of cyber porn or meeting the prostitute or having non-stop sexathons or anonymous sex in the park at four in the morning. Whatever their ritual is, for example they start literally having changes in their brain. Their brain starts um, changing at the cellular level in anticipation of their drug or hit, okay? So by the time a sex addict actually engages in the act of sex, if you will, physically, they are already high, and this can be documented, okay? You can see it on a SPECT scan, for example. They are in an altered state. There is no question. I can tell the difference when a sex addict comes into my office and the infamous question that they all hate me asking is, so are we sober today? I don't have to ask in some sense. I can tell. I can tell in the way they look. I can tell by the way they're slinging their sentences together. They're stoned. They're stoned. And they say, well, I've been sober for at least 24 hours. Okay, so you're stoned. Okay, you, you haven't, your brain hasn't recovered yet. The hardcore science behind a process addiction shows that in order for us to call something a process addiction, it means that in whatever their addiction is, sex, eating, gambling, uh, cutting, that there are documented neurological changes that occur in their brain, and here's the, here's the definitive part, that do not occur for the rest of the world that don't have that addiction, okay? If a normal person, I should say normal person, if a non-sex, whatever that means, if a non-addicted person engages in addictive behavior, they'll be high, and then when they're done, they won't be high anymore. 
to the process addicted individual who engages in those things they are high before during and after their brain is altered for a period of time and unless they abstain from their drug of choice they will stay altered which is to say stoned now that's interesting uh, if i think back in my own experience in the uh, mid 80s in the 12 step world and the distinction that is made between, um, say, alcoholic and addict, my sponsor at the time right. would say, well, you know, if you put uh, 10 people in a chair and force feed them alcohol, only one of them is going to become an alcoholic. But if you give 10 people heroin, physiologically, everyone is going to become a heroin addict. Maybe that's over oversimplifying well, the case. <laughs> Let, let me speak to that. There is some truth to that. It's just not the entire truth. For example, anybody who does enough cocaine, will one of two things will happen. You'll either die from it, from a heart attack or an embolism, or you'll become addicted. There are some substances that no matter who you are, um, you can become addicted to. Okay? Now, it, it does that... It, is alcohol part of that? Uh, actually, not necessarily. We know cocaine. We know heroin. Certain drugs will permanently alter everybody. Sex is not one of them. Gambling is not one of them. Um, there's some debate with alcohol. Um, eating is not one of them. Um, people who are not eating disorders, who do not have an eating addiction, will either, um, you know, vomit and then, you know, aspirate or, or sleep or whatever. They won't necessarily become addicted. And this is where it is very important in the process addictions to understand that people who have a process addiction have the process addiction because they already have a damage to part of their brain. Okay, so that people that don't have damage to that part of their brain are not going to be susceptible to those things in the way that those with the damage are. Now, is the damage, the obvious next question, is the damage always something that occurs uh, after birth uh, during the development stages or what are the um, genetic implications of becoming Oh, that's a great question. Process? Yeah, of course, I, you know, I, I, I'd be holding that Nobel Prize if I could fully answer that. But here's what we know and what we're, if you will, looking to know and, or on the verge of knowing. Um, and that is that um, the best way to answer that question um, is to give you an example, if you will. Um, sexual addiction is probably, it's got to be close to, at this point with all the research, close to a 75 to 85% certainty that most of the people that are sex addicted have that secondary to childhood trauma in the way that I talked about before. However, here is where um, your question really takes hold. Because what about all of the, if you will, new cyber porn addicts that are now, whether they're they're teenagers, children, or adults, that never had, say, a sex addiction, never had a problem with pornography, that sort of all of a sudden in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and beyond are becoming literally addicted to cyber porn, okay, to internet por pornography that didn't previously have any sex addiction beforehand, okay. And here's the best way that we can answer that question. The problem with internet pornography is that neurologically it does something to your brain very different and very damaging and does so very quickly neurologically that if you will, normal porn, i.e. the magazine under the bed, didn't do before. And so people who didn't previously have um, an alteration in their brain, secondary to childhood trauma, can, like in the example of cocaine I gave earlier, can after, you know, hours and hours and hours and days and days and days of nonstop um, uh, uh, cyber porn watching streaming videos, and that's important, by the way, because it changes the brain differently than still life porn can then become sexually addicted 
without previous childhood trauma. Similar okay? to similar to the way the addiction without or trauma without touch occurs, I would assume. That's a, that's that's correct. Because what we now know, and this is ongoing research, what we now know, and I mentioned this in my blog, The Sex Addicted Brain, is that cutting edge research now states and is is demonstrating that when we see those streaming videos Okay, what happens is because of the way our occipital lobe works, meaning our eyeballs focusing back and forth, and with something brand new called mirror neurons, um, read a book called uh, um, Mirroring People, just came out, wonderful book, we'll talk about this. Because of the new neuroscience we now know in terms of how the brain receives these streaming video images, okay, that the brain now becomes that much more susceptible to alteration in a very immediate sense. This is cutting edge research and I am fascinated. It has to do with mirror neurons um, and it has to do with how the brain receives streaming video. So we now know that, and this is horrible, we are now in the process of creating a whole generation of 10-year-olds, 11-year-olds, 13-year-olds who are becoming sexually addicted without having any sexual abuse background. Um, gee, aren't we wonderful that we can do that? Um, so this is now um, becoming a secondary problem that um, we can't address it fast enough. My office is being flooded by, because I also see children, my office is being flooded with sex-addicted kids. Um, th this is this is a problem. <laughs> I think if Adam Carolla were listening in, he'd say, hey, all 14-year-old boys are sex-addicted. Um. <laughs> well, they're, they're sexually charged, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. So really, we need a bumper sticker that says uh, cyber porn causes brain damage. It does. It does, and we do. Um, and this is why um, my biggest fan club, and, and I mean this genuinely and, and, and sincerely, is the religious right. Um, you know, I'm a Woodstock baby. How did that happen? Um, but I have to tell you, uh, on this one, I'm on their side. Uh, you know, cyber porn... Uh, and again, as someone coming from the radical left of the 60s, I have to say I, I never thought I'd live to see the day. Well, we but, can't compartmentalize uh, our, our politics either. <laughs> uh, you know what? A personal experience has indeed shown me this light. Um, but I have to say that um, cyber porn is sort of our new enemy. Yeah. And when you get it, please send me one of those bumper stickers, okay? I will, I will proudly put it on. Well, it's it's very interesting because, um, well, for a lot of reasons. But I'm I'm uh, trying to understand addiction in my own life and to treat the ongoing uh, uh, condition of being an addict. And you know, just looking at these um, different uh, participating in different types of treatments, I've created uh, meditation groups. Um, participated in ongoing psychotherapy. I just completed my sixth year with the same uh, psychiatrist who told me on day one, I'm not going to be the med guy. You have to commit to therapy if you want to work through this. You know, yeah. and, you know, 12 step um, uh, participation ongoing, and, as well as intensive long term Buddhist practices. And it just seems to me that I don't, there aren't that many people in the world, uh, in, at least in the, in the, uh, 12 step world, the people that I come in contact with, or professionals, or spiritual teachers who really have this kind of comprehensive, at least be the beginnings of a comprehensive integrated view. Correct. And that is my mission. Um, when I work with um, addicts, um, and by the way, I also, you know, see drug addicts and, and, um, uh, and alcoholics, which was my initial training a bazillion years ago. Um, when I see addicts in general, especially process addicts, but my background, which was initially psychoanalytic and then became staunchly cognitive behavioral, um, uh, and I meld the two. Um, it is about being connected. It is about attaching. And you know what? In order to be the best therapist I can be, that means 
I'm attaching as well. So there has to be a reciprocal, it's not an even relationship, that's for sure, but it is reciprocal in terms of attachment, in terms of a give and take, in terms of my role my greatest role to my patients is to model and by modeling I model, model my attachment to them with boundaries my uh, my patients know a little bit about my life um, you know a little bit in certain areas that is applicable to them to model my ability to appropriately attach to them to be there for them in a boundary oriented sense yet founded in very staunch cognitive behavioral principles. We talk about the here and now, yet we do so in a very relational attached way, as we also talk in a very safe way about what they went through. My patients, most of them are men, are able to sit and talk to me about the deepest most shame-based things because my my patients all live in a shame-based world you know my job is to help them get out of that and see their life in another way shame is their addiction if you will I understand that I grew up in this kind of family by the way I understand it from a personal and a professional place. I know where they're coming from. My job is to help them see themselves in another more realistic way and to do so in an attached, related way with boundaries so that they can then do that outside of the office. And um, that is my greatest gift, if you will, to my patients, whose greatest gift to me is their ability to sit there and be open and vulnerable. And you know what? Ain't no better gift. I don't know how else to say that. Yeah, I mean, my therapist pointed out to me once, you know, he said, well, isn't it interesting that you've sat here for four years and quietly and calmly discussed these intense issues? And, he, you know, he's not the guy who uh, gets dramatic like say for example if anger is your issue as it has been mine and i grew up in that kind of rage-filled family environment whenever right. the feelings came up it became an extremely volatile dangerous situation physically verbally emotionally and to be able to bring that up in in a contained healthy uh, supportive accepting kind of rogerian um uh, environment uh boy it takes time though doesn't it it doesn't it does. happen overnight it doesn't happen overnight, but when it happens, the world just begins. It really it's does. Wonderful. It really does. I've, I've noticed that for myself as well, that there are certain things that, you know, for example, I'm doing yoga now, and I've noticed that if I do a little bit of a yoga practice, uh, it changes everything. It changes my Absolutely. entire outlook on life. So if I were to say to you, um, we can document that from a neuroscience perspective, we know that to be true. We know that meditation, I just sort of did a little Twitter on that, if yeah, you will. Yeah. We know that meditation and spirituality in general um, changes your brain for the better. It calms your amygdala. It calms your limbic system. It gives you a much better grounded, calmer sense and place with which you can sort of be. We know that neurologically. Yeah, and it's very interesting. I'm just thinking of Venerable Robina Corton, who's one of my been one of my main Buddhist teachers. She always really hammers the point that you know, according to the materialist view. Um, you, you are your brain, uh, your mommy and daddy made you according to the Buddhist view, you know, you're, uh, a stream of consciousness, uh, without beginning and without end, uh, that is not to say an immortal soul, but you know, there are subtle differences. And I just uh, got this idea when you were speaking that, you know, you know, maybe I'm brain damaged. No, I'm definitely brain damaged from my addiction, whatever my addiction may be. Um, but Meditation and prayer and spiritual practices and physical activities and nutrition and all of these different components of treating comprehensively the condition of addiction kind of helped me kind of tune up my vehicle a little bit. Absolutely. I'm, I'm glad you said that. And the way that you said that, what, one of the things that I impress upon my patients over and over again 
important is that, you know, first you have to understand that your addiction, whatever it is, isn't about your morals. That's your, in a sense, that's your behavior, okay? But it begins with understanding, understanding why you have what you have in your case, you know, um, uh, your psychiatrist has, and and uh, the folks in your Buddhist uh, practice, have been instrumental in uh, pinpointing and outlining to you exactly where this comes from, from family dynamics when you're young. You know, growing up in a rageful family um, uh, is what changes your limbic system. It changes your biochemistry. You know, you're, you're not going to be a docile human being when you grow up in a rageful family. Um, it, it's going to change your chemistry. So the best way to be in recovery, you know, not just sobriety, but to actually be in recovery, which is my goal for, for my Important folks distinction. in the world. <laughs> the oh, absolutely. In the 12-step world, the difference between being dry and being sober, as we would define. <laughs> that's right. That's right. You know, y- 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 you can just stop drinking, and, you know, that's good for you. Um, but you're, you're sober, but you're not, in my vernacular, you're not in recovery. Recovery is a way of life. And recovery means that you understand what's gone on, which now gives you, in a sense, the tools with which to help change or repair the damages done. That includes sleeping well, eating well, um, whether it's prayer or um, some sort of spiritual sense about you, however you go about doing that. Um, Exercise from a very holistic way. The brain is holistic and you have to treat yourself holistically. And when you do good things for yourself, guess what? we then see ourselves as a good person and we then do more good things for ourselves. And in a sense, um, we actually become more grounded because we're feeding ourselves well, feeding ourselves nutritionally from a sleep perspective, from a philosophical perspective, from a philosophical perspective, (laughs) from a learned perspective. The things you choose to read, you know, People who we know that people who are depressed, for example, it, tune into depressive aspects of the universe. Sure. They <laughs> see things that are depressing. They literally cannot pick up on smiles as readily as nice things readily. So the more you do good for yourself, the more your brain will reward you by literally focusing on those things in the universe that are good and healthy. It's an amazing thing. It is. And boy, we could really go on for a long time. I'm thinking of several topics. I'd love to invite you to uh, have further conversations with me and the uh, listening audience about uh, some topics such as the uh, neurology and dynamics of relapse, the, oh, um, yes. the, the benefits yes. of cognitive restructuring through visualization, in particular type of meditative experiences, um, and, and other uh, fascinating um, areas of endeavor. I thank you very much, Dr. Ullman, for taking the time. This has really been a fascinating and intriguing conversation. My pleasure, Darren. Um, Thanks uh, to you. Thanks for finding me, so to speak. And um, we will be in touch. You have a fabulous website and um, I wish your listeners well. Thank you.